So, Toin Bokule has a large cast of characters, yet none seem to create quite the same raw emotional reaction from readers as Mediv. She is an emblem of male misogyny in the Toin. She is a fascinating character to be recuperated for feminist work. She is a model of bad female behavior. She is a figure to be rescued. Her actions are the result of the failings of other characters. She is euhemorized goddess, wife in a marriage of equals, misplaced female commander, empowered warrior, bleeding female body, fertility, menstruation, political and militaristic power. With this emblematic goddess slash human slash queen figure, there is a potential for many different readings. Rather than revisit or explore a new interpretation of Mediv in this paper, I intend to work with several readings of Mediv as she enters conversation with Fevim, a bonfiliath or a female seer. In Mediv's brief interchange with Fevim, many of the elements that compose Mediv's character are at stake. Blood, military victory, otherworldly power, and the place of women within the militaristic world of the text. As Mediv prepares her army, her army is from Connacht, by the way, her army for an attack on Ulster, she is approached by Fevim, a female seer of Connacht. Upon request, Fevim initiates a series of prophetic remarks which Mediv mediates as she attempts to reinterpret Fevim's ominous words, at q ferderg foro, at q ruyf. Um, this translates to, I see very red, I see red, or as Kensilla translates it more poetically, I see red, I see crimson. Um, Michael Enright has famously noted the way this conversation between Mediv and Fevim takes on a song-like tone of call and response, thus constructing both women as actors within the ritual of prophecy. In both dialogue and status, the two women reflect each other, but the reflection occurs with significant difference, shifting senses of power and gender. Mediv and Fevim share a duality as figures of both the natural world and the preternatural although their identities are comprised in very different ways. Mediv is frequently identified as a euhemorized goddess figure, possibly a sovereignty goddess. Uh, most famously, Frank O'Connor has used this explanation to make sense of Mediv's unusual behavior, particularly her sexual rapacity and her frequent pairings with king figures or figures of a hyper-masculine type, such as Fergus McRoy, whose name means manly vigor, son of the great stallion. Um, <laughs> Don't get a better name than that. Uh, such an argument is too long for the confines of this paper. But suffice to say, it is very convincing, and Mediv's behavior is unique by the standards of human women in Irish literature, but fits quite well to the scheme of an otherworldly woman or sovereignty goddess. Numerous linguistic features of the poem support this conclusion. Such a euhemorized status, such as O'Connor suggests, leaves Mediv a mortal woman, but taking actions and power that are distinctly unusual for mortal women within the canon of early Irish writing. Fevim, likewise, is distinctly marked by signifiers of the other world, and in fact identifies herself as from Sikruavaka in the second recension of the text. Fevim travels alone wearing rich clothing, a trope which is typically reserved for otherworldly women. She also has three pupils in the first recension of the text. While perhaps more normalized than one would think in early Irish literature, Possessing multiple pupils, fingers, or toes is still usually a preternatural marker. Um, Fethim is also described as Anath Ginnith. I'm pronouncing that right. Anath Ginnith is a word which means wonderful or marvelous, but is traditionally reserved for a description of otherworldly figures or things. Like Mediv, I believe this figure to be reintegrated into the natural. Specifically, it seems to me that Fethim, a character whose name derives from the word for sight, is defined by her profession as Bonfili, or woman seer. The role of Bonfili is inherently liminal and fraught with the need for other otherworldly knowledge. Seer figures such as Kafbad or Finn McCool are typically human, yet marked and shaped by the other world, free to move through liminal spaces and acquire preternatural foresight through liminal rituals such as Imbosh Forshna. In fact, Dorothy Schwartz argues that Fetham's physical description and inherently preternatural leanings are in fact typical for descriptions of female seers in literature of the period. All of these preternatural markers then are functions of human profession, which would have been given to Mev for a well-defined place within human social and political systems. Like Mev then, Fetham appears in the Toyn as human, yet deeply tied to the other world and preternatural power. Further, both women claim loyalties not to men, as is typical portrayals of early Irish women, for a defense of this, I would recommend Phil O'Leary's The Honor of Early Irish Women. 
Um, but in fact, these women claim loyalty to their home territory. Medhev is, importantly, the biological link to kinship of Connacht. It is only through his marriage to her that Alil becomes king of Connacht. Medhev sets the conditions for her husband as generosity, bravery, and a lack of jealousy. She creates the sort of co-ruler co she wishes to work with, so that her political power within Connacht will not be constrained. Medhev and Alil are reoccurring characters in many other stories as well. They are an outside authority to be deferred to in Brick Reader's Feast, and a long-standing militaristic foe in Intoxication of the Ulef. But the one unwavering attribute of Medhev in all of her portrayals is she is always Queen of Connacht, biologically linked to the province and its lineage. Whether that is as a foreign sovereign to defer to for judgment or a military opponent, an essential element in her construction is that Medhev is the Queen of Connacht and Connacht embodied. Likewise, political ties to Connacht are one of the first ways Fetham introduces herself to Medhev, calling herself Bon Pumo, or a bondmaid of Medhev's. Despite preternatural markings of her appearance, Fetham is careful to present herself as a Connacht woman and a subject of Medhev's, working for the victory of Connacht in the upcoming battle. Fetham is self-identified as both otherworldly and a woman who owes a mortal allegiance to Medhev. Her position as woman of Connacht, and explicitly one of Medhev's people, forms a bond between Medhev and Fetham. Fetham is clearly defined and self-defined as woman seer, a position that is well established in the culture of early Irish literature. Both of these women have preternatural signifiers, but they are also clearly enmeshed in very ordinary political and social systems of the text, as Connacht women and self-identifying through provincial alliances. Um, Medhev and Fetham parallel each other in their fulfillment of political obligations. Their first conversation before the battle, then, is significant, not only because it foretells the outcome of the battle, but because the two women share this conversational moment, rather than Medhev and a male seer. Um, Medhev and Fetham take on a call and response pattern, making this textual moment a sort of ritual in which they are both actors. Uh, this is the moment when Medhev has a voice in Fetham's prophecy. Because of Medhev's repeated protests and counter-arguments to Fetham's simple, I see red, Medhev and Fetham take on a tone of ritualized argument, one in which Medhev is doomed to lose. It is a female voice that offers the ritualized and repeated refutation of Medhev's logical assertions that her army will prevail. Again, Fetham is offered as a female who is performing her social role properly, but her social role is not entirely passive and distinctly not domestic. Fetham functions offstage to rally support for Medhev's doomed war, even when she knows the war effort will fail. Fetham properly performs the roles demanded of her by a masculine honor code, both by being a female voice that foretells the ultimate failure of Medhev's military campaign, and a female foil to Medhev, who correctly performs her duties within the bonds of a masculine honor world. Fetham functions as an alternative, if flawed model of female behavior. Certainly, Fetham's subjectivity is limited by the fact that she is still functioning within a masculine honor code, and that her actions are ultimately for the good of the Connacht people. But the text does seem to allow a positive, or at least neutral, female subjectivity that appears even as she proclaims the ultimate demise of Medhev's subject, or Medhev's militaristic subjectivity. Um, the second point I would like to address relates specifically to the color-coded language of the interaction between Medhev and Fetham. Language of redness and blood repeatedly takes on many functions throughout the toy. But there is something unique in the way blood and redness is deployed between Fetham and Medhev in their interactions. Within Fetham's prophecy, as well as many other places in the toy, ideas of blood and redness are alighted. Fetham's response to Medhev's request for prophecy is always, at q fer derg ferro, at q roiva. Without any textual clues, Medhev correctly argues that the prophecy against the prophecy's certain theme, the defeat of Connacht. In order to argue against the defeat of Connacht, Medhev must have decoded the prophecy and understood the language of red was referring to blood, and specifically the blood of her defeated army. She does not acknowledge, um, I'm sorry, she does not acknowledge any of her decoding of the prophecy, but demonstrates her understanding by intelligently refuting Fetham's prophecy, arguing that the Ulster men are in their yearly labor pains and therefore incapable of fighting, making a victory of the Connacht men inevitable. Four times, Medhev responds to Fetham's prophecy, attempting to refute or reverse the inevitable dis demise of Connacht. Here, the text is explicitly handling the idea of blood as blood flowing from battle wounds. But the predominant imagery of Medhev's reply invokes idea of female fertility 
and implicitly carries undertones of menstrual blood, especially if you know the character of Medev, and blood created during the birthing process, female blood and vaginal bleeding. Medev's repeated return to the debility of the Ulstrom is interesting. Certainly it is a tactical advantage that her enemy is suffering from labor pains, but it is also a profoundly disturbing inversion of patriarchal warrior culture. Medev, a female military leader, is able to attack because a great number of masculine heroes of Ulster are <coughs> suffering from birth pains. The world order has literally been turned upside down. Fetham foretells men bleeding, and Medev instantly associates this blood with birthing as well as war. Just as Medev's inversion as a female on the battlefield is problematic, so too the text is troubled by men birthing in bed. And it is not surprised that it is Fetham, oh, it is Medev who calls Fetham's attention to this inversion and disrupts the normal process of war and enables a woman to enter the masculine world of battle and battle blood. After Fetham offers up her prophecy for the fourth time, Medev seems resigned to her argument regarding the labor pains of the Ulstermen and returns to a more normative worldview, arguing that men are always covered in blood and wounds from battle. So Fetham's prediction of more blood does not mean so much defeat as it means a continuation of masculine violence and war, both of which govern this world's laws and society and Medev's participation in them. In her final reply to Medev's formulaic question, Fetham gives the same prophecy, but continues to a much larger prophetic announcement about Cahalan, which is full of language of masculine blood and blood of battle wounds. She foresees that, quote, the army will be bloodstained before him, and, quote, blood will flow from heroes' bodies. Yet the blood here, too, is multivalent. Blood and redness seem to be a language of beauty and feminine desire. Twice, Fetham calls attention to the red cloak in which Cahalan is wrapped. The cloak is described as derg, or for derg, just as redness, implicitly blood, <coughs> seen on Medev's army, was also described using the word derg. Thus, there is an illusion between the redness of the cloak and the redness of a man covered in blood. Fetham continues these images of blood throughout the prophecy. She recounts Cahalan's ferocity on the battlefield and his ability to shed blood in the same sentence in which she tells Medev that Cahalan is handsome and greatly attractive to women. Implicitly, Fetham, and perhaps Medev, are among the women who would desire Cahalan sexually. Cahalan, enveloped in this red mantle, becomes an object of desire for both the women as Fetham performs her prophecy, creating an image of Cahalan that is threatening, bloody, and sexually desirable. Oddly, it appears that both of these women are sharing a moment of bonding over desire for this bloody and threatening figure. It is a very masculine, there is a very masculine element to the way Fetham directs her gaze over Cahalan through prophecy. Through the prophetic view, Fetham has complete control over a gaze, which is explicitly sexualized, as she discusses Cahalan's physical desirability. Under this gaze, Cahalan remains completely objectified, with no control or awareness of the situation. Blood and beauty melded, for a moment Cahalan is entirely object to Medev's control, Fetham's controlling gaze, which she shares with Medev, a woman notorious for her aggressive sexual desires and her desire to kill Ulstermen. Ultimately, this potential element of control will be suppressed, as Cahalan moves out of the scope of prophecy and becomes a physical presence in the text. Once realized physically, Cahalan regains agency and acts to thwart Medev's militaristic aspirations. Thus, the liminal moment of prophecy ends, and the text returns to a normative patriarchal world, in which Cahalan restrains Medev on numerous occasions, watches her while she is unaware, and displays his physical power over her by killing her pets. Yet in the moments surrounding Fetham's prophecy, the text contains a significant elision between menstrual <coughs> blood and the blood of battle wounds and blood of the birthing bed. The elision is mirrored in the bodies of the women having this conversation. Medev is both female, and especially later in the story, clearly associated with menstrual blood. But menstrual blood occurs in a misplaced context. Her menstruation occurs on the masculine battlefield at the very end of the text causing Cahalan to withdraw, either from fear or revulsion, and refuse to fight her. Cahalan is withdrawing from a sort of aberration, the wrong sort of blood on the battlefield, a feminine blood. It is hard to read earlier scenes involving Medev without being reminded of this central and shocking moment later in the text. Um, for the sake of this essay, I'm working under the assumption, and I think it's a pretty well accepted, although not completely accepted one, that at least in some point in its transmission, at least partially, the Twain Bokuli has had an oral life. Given the nature of orality, oft repeated and based upon well-known traditional figures, 
It is likely that the audience of this text was already aware of the final significant moments of the story when reading or hearing these scenes. It is in this flexibility and repetition of oral tradition that I argue Medivh must always be read with regards to menstrual blood and the blood of battle wounds throughout the twine. This elision is not unproblematic. It represents an anomaly, a collision of the feminine and the masculine that repels Cahullin and elicits the disgust of the narrator, just as Medivh herself represents the anomaly of a female warrior on the, on the battlefield. To a lesser extent, Fetham embodies this elision as well. As mentioned earlier, Fetham's appearance is reminiscent of an otherworldly woman. She is armed in earlier recensions of the text, driving her own chariot. Her actions, rallying the men of Ireland to aid Connacht, are also very masculine. Yet the te text is explicit about the physical desirability of both Medivh and Fetham. These women occupy positions that are troublingly masculine and feminine. Anne Dooley has suggested that Fetham's prophecy is one of the few moments in Irish literary tradition where two women are allowed to have a conversation about the desirability of a man. She relates this to Aber's praise of Cahullin in Brookrea's Feast. Ah, uh, this moment, this is certainly a unique moment of female conversation, but it is not limited to sexual desire the way Aber's speech is. Medivh and Fetham are also discussing battlefield strategy. Blood represents sexual desirability, and one's militaristic nemesis may also be the object of one's sexual gaze. Of course, this moment in the text is brief. Ultimately, Fetham vanishes from the text, and Medivh is defeated in humiliating fashion. However, there is something troubling and intriguing about the ways in which Fetham mirrors Medivh. As Connacht woman and a liminal otherworldly woman, Fetham seems to imply a proper, albeit troubled, female agency. She performs her political duties correctly, whereas Medivh does not. Fetham utilizes her preternatural gifts without textual repercussions. Their discussion about blood, desire, and redness cements and complicates a link between these two women. Although Fetham is ultimately correct in foreseeing Medivh's defeat, she allows Medivh to be a participant in her ritual and performs her territorial duties to Medivh as Queen of Connacht. The text offers a limited yet powerful perspective on female agency before returning to the ensuing masculine honor battles and Medivh's ultimate defeat.